unified terror, which paralyzes needed efforts to convert... To all of you who are joining us today, um, my name is Della Rucker. I am the principal of the Wise Economy Workshop and communication manager for the American Independent Business Alliance, or AMEBA. And I'm delighted today to have an opportunity to talk with Eric Peebles, who is the executive director of AMEBA. And our goal here today is really to introduce you to this organization. Some of you are familiar with it. Some of you, it, it may be relatively new to you. I know for folks that have been uh, reading, to my great thanks, my work over the last many years, um, a lot of what you're going to hear out of Derek with regard to Amoeba, particularly where Amoeba is today, and where Amoeba wants to go in the future, that's gonna sound um, kind of familiar to you. And so I'm delighted and honored to be able to work with this organization to help to bring some of those things to reality. So Derek, thank you for joining me today. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate it. Why don't you? Oh, thank you. All right, awesome. Why don't you start out with a little bit of an introduction? Uh, tell us a little bit about your own background and how you got involved in Amoeba initially. Uh, sure. So uh, as far as background, um, going way back, I started my career in small business banking. Uh, with J.P. Morgan Chase Bank, and that led to a community development position where I was doing some commercial banking, but also doing some community reinvestment. This was around the time uh, before and a little bit after the um, 2009 economic meltdown. And so my experience with that and, and just my experience and in, in working with my clients and and kind of seeing, um, you know, the community and where it stood after the economic meltdown. It was uh, my time because they were laying off bankers left and right, obviously, uh, after the crisis. And so it was my chance to really get into um, what I would call community economic development. And that's a combination of community development and economic development. You know, one is where what community development is about creating a quality of life. It's about, you know, the social services and it's a more community driven, whereas economic development is about creating jobs and, and building wealth. And so I kind of stuck myself in between um, because I saw that the two functions, economic and community development, were not really working together. And for strong local economies, I felt that that was really important to start doing work uh, in that area. And so fast forward, you know, about 10 years or so of doing that work and, and, and uh, holding uh, multiple leadership positions um, with key organizations here in Cincinnati, I joined Amoeba uh, about four years ago as a board member. And if you remember, Della, you were the one that introduced me to Amoeba mm -hmm. and uh, took me out to Montana where I <clears throat> got to meet the folks and and it just kind of took off from there. So I was invited to, uh, plus they were like, <clears throat> they were liking a lot and kind of resonated with um, a lot of the things that I was talking about, about merging community development and economic development together for sustainable uh, community development. And so they really kind of resonated with that. And, and at the time, one of the things that I was seeing was that um, throughout this work, small businesses were not really being focused on and so it was really kind of just a natural match and i joined the board and um, one of my first projects as a board member was i led the diversity campaign mm -hmm. um, where i traveled around to about five different affiliates around the country and spoke about asset-based community development uh, in the sense of what um, small business alliances can do um, to to help strengthen their local economy and uh, so, you know, last July, uh, the co-directors who started Amoeba 20 years ago decided that um, they wanted to turn a new leaf and, and um, start new endeavors. And so there was a six-month process where they were uh, basically 
um, working on stepping down. And I was uh, effectively recruited to take over the position as executive director, and that happened last July. And so um, I could talk briefly about just the MEBA, if nobody knows, I'm sure not many people are, may not know about it. So um, AMEBA, as it stands for the American Independent Business Alliance, mm -hmm. AMEBA was started 20 years ago, and the primary objective in the mission which still uh, stands today was to um, support the growth and development of local business alliances across the country. And this happened in the form of IBAs, which stands for Independent Business Alliance. There's a real six, uh, succinct mm -hmm. difference between a local independent business alliance and your local chamber of commerce. Um, so, however, you know, we've been uh, very instrumental in starting IBAs across the country, but we also work with downtown um, associate business associations. We work with Main Street organizations, and we still work with chambers of commerce. Uh, our primary um, goal and and the resource that we provide has been around buy local and uh, creating effective buy local campaigns. And so that's what we do. We help local alliances, chambers, downtown associations across the country and provide them with resources on how to build effective buy local campaigns. Uh, another piece of that is, is consumer education based, which is really educating um, our citizens around the impact of spending their dollars locally um, because the dollars circulate locally and they recirculate and it leaves uh, people better off when they have a strong local economy that's not, um, um, you know, primarily uh, ran by chains and multinational companies. And, and so um, that's our bread and butter. That's what we continue to do today. Great, great, thank you. Uh, why don't you give us a real quick, and I, I apologize that I started to ask this, but I didn't want to break your, your chain. Um, what, for people who aren't familiar with it, give us a little bit of an explanation of what you meant by asset-based community development and how that, um, how for you that connects to the work of, of buy local and consumer education and this, this larger question that we're going to be talking about of, um, kind of changing the, the trajectory of a local economy. So if you just define ABCD. Mm -hmm. Sure, I've been practicing asset-based community development, another acronym, ABCD, and I've been practicing that for about 15 years now. And, and basically, the model of ABCD is prefaced in the sense that assets are already in a community that are unleveraged. So from a high level, you know, ABCD is really about linking the micro assets to the macro environment. I throw out a lot of economic terms, but um, that that's really kind of what ABCD is. It's all about building the communities from the inside out. And so a lot of people like myself, you, um, people who are credentialed and professional, they often um, use research and, and, and I would say misguided data but uh, traditional data processes to determine a narrative of a community. And those narratives uh, are often built on the deficiency of a community. And so if you're somebody like me that's worked in nonprofits for most of my life after I left banking, uh, if you're an organization or an individual applying for services, um, the, the first thing that they're gonna ask you is, uh, you know, questions that are based on what's wrong with you uh, so they can determine what kind of services and help you need. Well, asset based community development is the opposite. It's really a mindset shift and it's really about focusing on the possibilities of an individual's life and the possibilities of a community and leveraging the assets that are already in the community uh, that are uh, being overlooked. And so oftentimes, um, what maintains status quo and uh, keeps marginal communities marginalized is, is that um, we feel like the professionals feel like we know what's best for that community 
And so ABCD is really about building relationships and asking a specific design set of questions that really focus on what is working and, and what are the possibilities based on the assets that that individual may hold, but also the assets that that community may hold, which is the schools, which is the local businesses, which is the social services within a community, which is also the social cohesion of the individuals that live in a neighborhood or a community. And so part of um, what community economic development is about is merging all of those facets together for sustainable community development. And ABCD is just a methodology that really shifts the mindset of people that are really doing this work to get at a new narrative. Um, does that, I know that's pretty high level, but that that's essentially what it is. No, and, and, and I think, you know, as you and I have talked about before, that's incredibly profound, the difference in um, what's possible when you come at this from an asset point of view a possibility point of view versus the deficiency point of view, which most of us were taught to, to uh, lean into um, from our early days. And having given that definition and having brought this question of asset-based community development into the conversation, I think that's a great setup for what it is that Amoeba asked you to take on in in, in stepping into this role. So when the board asked you and, the, and, and you know, kind of cajoled you to some extent mm -hmm. into stepping into this position, what did they want you to do that was different from what Amoeba had done for the previous 20 years? Sure, so just to give uh, um, a context, Amoeba was one of the two founding organizations of the local economy movement. And, and so they brought me on because the local economy movement needs in innovation. And, and so looking at my leadership that they were attracted to, um, it was really kind of um, how can we take this organization uh, into the next phase of the local economy movement. So it was really, I was brought on to, to transition the organization uh, really into the 21st century. And I would say that um, a lot of what attracted me to Amoeba and attracted them to me was this idea of changing the narrative of how we think about our local economies. And, and so um, just for example, when you look at just the, the whole topic of marketing, um, marketing is a tactic and it's a function that's really built around making consumers. And to strengthen the local economy, uh, it doesn't only take consumers, but it, it takes citizenship. Mm. And, and so it really, uh, I would say that it was it was the right time for Amoeba to move into that direction and focus on building relationships and breaking the silos and getting our local alliances connected with uh, people that make economic development policy decisions. Also, uh, how to deepen their relationships with their local independent business members. And so I was brought on as a connector and, and to connect and collaborate. And so that was one of the two things that Amoeba uh, had been struggling with, I would say over the past few years as Amazon kind of took on and started really kind of impacting and, and competing um, at a disadvantage with a lot of our uh, local independent businesses. And so my job was to connect and collaborate open up the silos and position Amoeba to not just be anti-big business, but to be a collaborator uh, and, and figuring out what we can all do together that we can't do on our own. And that's a big focus of asset-based community development. So, and that's been a lot of what my work has been based around since I left the banking industry, connecting the dots, yeah. Yeah, you've been, you've been more of a connector, connector of dots on the 
the grass from on the grassroots level to the national level more than you know a lot of us can ever claim to um in, <laughs> a, in a long career um and and there were some some really really lovely things that that you said in there about changing the narrative about talking about consume sh a mind shift from consumer to citizen and about you know deepening relationships and building uh rather breaking down we don't want to build more silos but we'll break the silos so so as as that kind of directive came forward what are some of the things that Amoeba kind of had in process? We're going to talk about the current situation with the COVID-19 pandemic, because that's on everybody's mind right now. And that's going to, of course, shape things going forward, certainly for the immediate future and probably for the very long future. Um, but if you think back to, to before what now feels like another era, you know, Three weeks ago or something mm -hmm. what what was amoeba looking at doing preparing to do at that point as part of making this pivot to changing the narrative building these relationships breaking down these silos deepening relationships with communities sure so amoeba serves about 60 different uh independent business alliances across the country um, we're represented in about 24 states and uh, serve about 30,000 independent businesses across the country. And as I took over as executive director, um, there was four kind of overarching uh, things that we want to we, that we wanted to put in place, and that we've been uh, you know successful in doing that prior to the crisis. One was to create and catalyze. And, and, and the second was to connect and collaborate. The third was convening, uh, community building, and, and we host our conference once a year. And that's really the one time where people get to connect and be together in person uh, and in real time where we could share best practices and come up with initiatives for the following year. And so I would say lastly is, is to collect information uh, combine and collaborate with other local and national programs that support uh, independent businesses and so it's really about building a fair and inclusive economy and with the with the leadership of amoeba with the way we're positioned we are working with those affiliates and those allies and we've established a variety of programs that address kind of how an affiliate can create an economy that is fair, equitable, and, and diverse, uh, but most importantly, inclusive. And so um, we've definitely ramped up the conversations. We have, you know, primarily have created toolkits that these alliances can use to change the conversation with their local elected officials to, to get them um, aware of really the impact of, of local uh, economies and local independent businesses. And, you know, it, it was, there's been some challenges and there's been some successes, but for the most part, if you've ever wondered what an economy would look like without your mom and pops and without your local independent businesses, we're living it now in this crisis. Um, so this is what it looks like to, to have a, a, a local economy that's missing. And, and you can see um, with what we're dealing with now and how people are really affected and hurt. And a lot of people won't be able to open up their businesses uh, when this crisis is over. And, and so our job is to now uh, advance our mission to start advocating on a federal and a state local government level uh, to, to really get policies passed that are friendly to local independent businesses that protects them for when disasters like this happen, um, you know, because if we don't change the infrastructure, if we don't change the mindset of how we think about our economy as a whole, um, when the next pandemic comes, we're going to be in this situation again, if not worse. Very good. Or the next in the next crisis of many kinds, we could come up with some other ones too. Yeah. Right. Right. Excellent. Um, you. You. And you. And you really nicely um, segued there 
into talking about, you know, what what we're experiencing right now as we are about, depending on where you are, we are um, somewhere around three weeks since the COVID-19 pandemic really hit the popular conscience in the United States and really started to change the way that we're living and working and talking and thinking and connecting and 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 at pretty much everything. Yep. So you have been having conversations, I know, constantly with people all over the country. I think you said yesterday that you'd been on the phone for seven or eight hours solid. Um, you you were on a couple of them. <laughs> I was on a couple of them, but not as many as you. No. So what it, tell me what you're seeing. Tell us about what you're seeing, what you're hearing, what 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 kind of themes and what kinds of trends you're starting to um, to get a sense of through all these conversations? <clears throat> well, obviously, I think what we are seeing is uh, we're seeing some resilience. Uh, I've seen a lot of resilience, and I would say that um, not uh, maybe the majority of the businesses haven't been able to do this, but a nice percentage of businesses have been able to transition um, their business models just within the past three weeks as we've dealt with this crisis, and 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 that's been uh, amazing. The other thing that I'm seeing is people are really scared and anxious and really at a place to where they really don't know what to do. And so a lot of energy is really focused on what is coming down in the stimulus package from the federal government. And uh, I could say personally, and I could probably speak on behalf of our movement that the, that the stimulus package is not enough to keep businesses alive. And, you know, um, what we're seeing is that it's probably going to take a few more trillion dollars uh, to really get the economy moving again, and, and it's going to have to be phased out. And so um, hearing now that uh, it may be three weeks before um, SBA really starts dispensing this cash, well, a lot of businesses are not going to be able to last that long. And um, the businesses that do uh, qualify and and will get the loans and the funding that's coming out. It won't keep them alive for more than three or four months, and so there's definitely going to be the need for another stimulus package. But I think uh, you know people are hopeful, and we're Americans, and so you know we we we've uh, we've been at work our existence. <laughs> and, and so I think uh, this is something that will will get past. But um, believe it or not, the opportunity that I see is the awareness that Americans as a whole um, have developed over really the importance of having a sound economy that could weather the storm during these type of situations. So I think once we come out of this crisis, there's going to be a lot of, uh, I think, a shift in cultural perspective, perspectives. And I think there's going to be a mass shift in how we think about our economy moving forward. Mm. Um, this generation that's alive today that's dealing with this crisis also dealt with the 2009 economic meltdown. And through what I've been researching, I've never, uh, I haven't come across uh, any other time in our country where we have dealt with a pandemic like this and also a recession um, within a 10 year span. Mm. And so this is very unique for us. And I think once we come out of this, um, we're going to be super aware. And I think it's also going to change our political landscape. Well, that's now, that's really fascinating. And, you know, we were talking, you and I were, well, you were speaking and I was listening on a, uh, a webinar that was put on by, um, it was the Harvard, Harvard Club, was that? The Harvard that? Club, yes, that was last night, yes. So, on the Harvard Club. And one of the things that you said really beautifully there was that we were seeing this transition, this increasing awareness of 
the importance of local communities, the attachment to local communities, the awareness of the importance of investing in the places that we care about, particularly through, through businesses that are locally invested. And you spoke beautifully about that. Um, you know, referencing even the fact of something as simple. I mean, we we can, you know, I'm I've spent a long time in economic development. I can spin out economic impact studies for you if needed. But even something as as crucial to the community as sponsoring little league teams. And you said, mm-hmm. you know, Amazon is not going to sponsor your local little league team, but your local restaurant, your local um your local shop, your local grocery store, your local, et cetera, they're going to be the ones who sponsor that. So, mm-hmm. you know, that, that's very, um, that's, that's a really crucial piece of this equation. And as you pointed out on, on that webinar last night, generally it seems like people have had more and more of an awareness of that, even to the point where my otherwise very conservative in-laws you know, place a high priority on buying local and going to local restaurants and independent businesses and et cetera, et cetera. Um, even when, you know, some of their other political beliefs might, you know, might might fall on a different place in the spectrum. So that, that understanding has really become pretty universal. Um, but it's been universal in maybe a little more of an abstract manner. Um, and I really loved how you described last night about how this is really driving that home. You used the metaphor of a backbone, the small businesses as the backbone of the community. Would you would you kind of do that again while we're on this now? Sure. So I spoke a little while ago about um, marketing, and I have an education in public relations. And it really took me uh, working in the economy, working in the corporate um, sector and working in the private sector, but also working in the public sector. And what I've seen is that really marketing and the messages that our Americans receive on a daily basis, every message that they receive on a daily basis, maybe eight times a day, they are being told that the products and what they have in their community is not enough. And our economy has shifted towards um, technology, which is great. I love technology, but it's also shifted towards um, this 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 idea and this insatiable desire for convenience. And through that, you have Amazon and you have Walmart. You have these big box chains that that offer that convenience, um, and and they are there. But these businesses do not pay taxes. Amazon does not pay taxes. And when you think about the bailout that we are receiving right now, um, we wouldn't receive this bailout if it wasn't for our own tax dollars. And so when you're talking about a company like Amazon, which this is a really kind of cultural type of um, conversation that I think needs to be spoke about, but even when you had heard about the situation of Amazon moving to New York City, when you look at Amazon, primarily the jobs that that go that Amazon offers are, are basically taken by people, um, quite honestly, in marginalized situations. Um, there may be situations where you have people that are retired and looking to earn a little bit of money, things like that. Uh, we live in a gig economy, so people are working multiple jobs, uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. But when you look at from a community perspective, when dollars are circulating locally and businesses is the foundation for keeping the dollars circulating locally. When those dollars are kept in a community, we have better schools, we have uh, better transit, we have better parks, we have, because this is what um, the tax base in a, in a local community pays for. Mm-hmm. And the reference that I was making last mm-hmm. night is that um, Amazon <laughs> doesn't pay taxes. So obviously they're doc- the dollars don't circulate locally. Um, And the people that work for Amazon often don't get the benefits that they should be receiving as a American employee. (laughs) And and, and so you have some, I think, misguided truths there 
where yes, Amazon may come into a community and offer 200 plus jobs, but that is really a short term gain uh, taken in place of a long term loss because we know that Amazon can just pick up and move whenever they want. Mm -hmm. And we know that they have no bring no character or anything like that to a community. And, and so um, when you look at, for instance, the independent booksellers, mm -hmm. when Amazon came around, they almost put independent booksellers out of business. We, over the past few years, have seen a resurgence in the activity of independent booksellers. They're mm -hmm. doing very well right now. And the reason is because they have adapted their business model to be uh, to more of a community supported business model meaning that a lot of independent bookstores, for instance, are now offering uh, coffee and they may have cafes in their shop. And so what you're seeing and the reason for that resurgence is that people in that live in the community where there is an independent bookstore, they go into that bookstore for the experience. Mm -hmm. And that is what has shifted. People are now looking for an experience in their neighborhood with their local businesses and Amazon doesn't provide that. And so that's the primary reason we've seen a resurgence in independent booksellers, for instance. And, and so that is a example of the success of our work and promoting effective by local campaigns, but also from a consumer education point, really kind of sharing data and and sharing narratives that make residents aware that yes you are a part of strengthening our local economy and how that is done is by you um, building relationships and, and having uh, a link to the businesses in your neighborhood and and, and so um, i can i can get on a soapbox about that all day but that's really kind of where uh is an example of the need to focus on community and the economy. I think we've gotten away from that um, through consumerism. And so a lot of what I talk about is how can we shift um, consumerism back into citizenship? Mm -hmm. And what is the role that local independent businesses, corporations, businesses of all sizes have to do with that? Um, but we know that if you're a chain, um, most likely, or a Starbucks or, or a Dunkin' Donuts, um, these businesses are headquartered elsewhere. So you may have a franchise that you may think is, yeah, I'm a local business because I, I own a franchise. But the question is, is are your dollars staying in the community through that franchise? And I would assume that it's probably not because under a franchise, there's different rules and regulations that um, require you to send money out of the community into the coffers of that uh, corporation um, because that's how they make money is by selling franchises. And mm -hmm. so uh, a lot of that has been really kind of educating uh, consumers and citizens on what an actual local independent business is, because you may think it's your local subway that is owned by somebody that's local, but it's really a matter of are those dollars staying local through that business mm -hmm. and through chains, oftentimes it doesn't. And we should point out you've been sipping from a United Dairy Farmers cup, which um, is a local Cincinnati institution, a southwest, southwestern Ohio institution that uh, we all love for their ice cream and their good coffee. And uh, uh, hey, they started out local. They may not be. They're they're a chain now, but uh, UDF started out local and and. and the reason I'm drinking UDF coffee at the moment is because uh, my local Carabello, where we always meet, is closed. <laughs> so. yeah, I know. That's a lot of them. Um, so, yeah. So, given everything that we've talked about, let's talk a little bit about what the priorities are for Amoeba. I know we're still, you know, you and I and many other people are still working on, okay, how do we most effectively respond? Fun to what's needed right now. Mm -hmm. But given that everything's still a little bit in flux, talk a little bit at a high level of what Amoeba's priorities are going to be in terms of actions, in terms of advocacy, in terms of 
of all of the 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 four C's that you actually it was like eight or ten C's because there was a lot of C's um, that you identified before. What's Amoeba going to be um, focusing on over the next call it three, four, or five months? I would say we are aiming to really kind of shift our focus towards reframing economic development. And um, there's other initiatives regarding, you know, um, you know, advocacy issues that I won't really get into that involves a lot of antitrust. Um, but uh, I would say our priority, which is really around connecting and collaborating really involves learning from other networks and other local economy leaders on how to grow and develop the uh the local independent business alliance and and that's what we'll continue to do and that's what we've always um have done i would say the the new expanded amoeba is really going to focus on a certain function of economic development which revolves around business retention and expansion we feel the need that, um, you know, BRNE, which is another acronym for business retention and expansion, is really an outdated model that hasn't served uh, local economies um, in years or maybe ever. And, and so we're really going to aim over the next few months is how can we refine how business retention and expansion is conducted. Um, in the economic development world, most of the resources that are put towards uh, local governments and economic development organizations really revolves around attracting large businesses to a community. Why? Because the incentives are based around that and it's based around job creation. Uh, however, very limited resources are put towards retaining businesses that are already in the community. So I talked about ABCD and asset-based community development and what that is. It's really about building communities from the inside out not from the outside in and building and focusing on the assets that are already there so when you're looking at business retention and expansion uh, there's not a whole lot that happens around business retention which is focusing on the businesses that are already located in your community and the business retention efforts that are conducted are often uh, spent towards um, well, the E side of BRNE and the E side of BRNE is expansion. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of those efforts are put towards expanding businesses that are already in a neighborhood or already in a community. Because, again, the incentives are built around how many jobs are being created. But we all know that the stronger a local economy is, the more independent businesses that you have in a community that those are the foundations that increases wages. Those are the foundations that, like I've said many times on this call, keeps the dollar circulating locally so mm -hmm. that youth in the community are doing a lot better, so that jobs are available to people who live in that community. So schools are doing better. Little leagues are, are, are doing well and, and businesses, transit, public transportation, uh, local food distribution all depends on the strength of how um, strong your local independent businesses are. And so we're really taking uh, a step into training our alliance leaders how to change the conversation with their economic development policymakers. And we feel by changing the conversation to focus on the assets that a local economy provides and the um, and the impact <clears throat> that it provides. Economic developers, city officials know this. They know that what I'm saying is true. Uh, however, they don't have the purview to really do anything about it because their incentives are not based around what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And so how do we change the incentives for, for um, city officials to really uh, not a not only attract businesses to the community, but retain the local ones that are there because those local businesses really is what provides that community character. And, and, and that allows for diversity to thrive and that allows for inclusiveness to happen. 
And, and so um, that's really kind of where we're going to be heading over the, the next three to five months. Excellent. Excellent. You know, and it's interesting that as I've been on calls over the last, you know, three weeks or so with economic development people, the people who are professionals in economic development, there's been a huge resurgence of interest and in, in realizing that they, their core responsibility right now is to do not only to do BR&E, to do business recruitment and expansion, I'm sorry, I always say that wrong, business retention and expansion, <laughs> probably a Freudian slip buried in there, but also that the, the challenge in front of, you know, my longtime colleagues in economic development and your longtime colleagues as well, because you, you've worked in that space, is, is the, the, the retention side. And we're starting to see that economic developers are often, you know, very intensively trying to figure out how to be helpful, but that the, the tools, the resources, the incentives, and basically the, the fundamental operating principles aren't really potentially up to the challenge of the moment. And so there's a huge demand on both the community side, the small business side, and the professional side to figure out a new way to do it and to figure it out yesterday. So yeah. um, that's why I'm particularly excited about the direction that Amoeba is going to be going. One more question. Sure. Um, what advice or encouragement do you have for the folks that are listening and watching this video in the future? We're in a tough place right now. There's a lot of opportunities. There's a lot of scary stuff. What would you say to them? I would say that there's no better time than now to plan and reinvent yourself. And that's where I kind of hold a lot of my motivation personally uh, during this time right now is, is what am I going to do after this is over? And, and what is my role um, as a citizen, as a, as a, as a small business advocate um, after this crisis? And I think we will, get through the storm. But I think the best piece of advice that I can give people that are on this call is to think really hard about how you're going to become an asset in your community. And, and, and so I think businesses and the economy will be able to get back up again. I think it's going to take time and so, you know, my other advice is, is to is to be patient, um, definitely pay attention to what we are doing and what others are doing, because uh, resources are coming out from the federal government to get us through this. I don't think it's enough, but um, what we can all do together is is advocate and, and keep people aware and 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 share the story of really what has happened over the pr uh, past three weeks and how that has affected us, um, our businesses and, and also us personally. You know, the thing about entrepreneurship and business owners and something that's never been focused on, even before this crisis, um, you and I years ago had discussions about um, the level of mental health concern within our entrepreneurship community and within our business owners. And so, um, make yourself aware, educate yourself, because a lot of what we are dealing with right now, um, I think is something that we've always tried to warn people about, or, you know, that's the reason why we, um, do what we do is to convince people that local economies really are the backbone of America. Uh, local independent businesses are really the backbone of our democracy. 
And, and, and so if, if you believe in democracy, there is a role that you as an individual um, have to play once we get out of this uh, crisis and, and even right now. So pay attention, um, read, educate yourself, and, and, and have a plan for when this crisis is over. And, and because there's no other better time to do that other than now, because we have the time. And so, you know, I would leave it there. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely a faith-based uh, individual. I'm an Episcopalian. And, and, and so a lot, of, um, a lot of my sanity relies in my faith. And, and, and so um, not to get religious, but faith really plays a part in what we're dealing with right now and, and how to get through this storm. Excellent. Great. Well, thank you, Derek. Um, it's been a great conversation. I'm really grateful for you taking the time to articulate um, your thoughts in, in kind of that direction and, and perception of what's needed and, and where we're going in the future. And I would just encourage people who are watching or listening to this to join Amoeba. Um, it's Amoeba A M. I-B-A dot net. At minimum, sign up for the newsletter so that you know what this organization is doing in partnership with a lot of very talented and, uh, and, and exciting and cutting edge organizations around the country. And um, if your financial situation warrants it, consider joining Amoeba. Joining gives you access to some additional resources that whether you're just a person who's interested in this work or you're a business who works with small businesses or you're an, you're a, an independent business alliance, a chamber of commerce, an economic development agency, any organization like that, there's special resources for you. Some of which are existing, some of which are IBA.net. So again, I'm Della Rucker. Um, principal of the Wise Economy Workshop and Communications Manager for Amoeba. And our guest today has been uh, Derek Peebles, who's the Executive Director of Amoeba. So thanks again, Derek. It's been, been great to hear you, you know, you, you, you articulate these things so well. Thank you. Thank you. And we should do more of this, for sure. We will. Uh, I somehow think we will. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, take care, folks, and uh, go get them. Thank you. This preeminently the time to speak the truth frankly and boldly. Nor need we shrink from honestly facing conditions in our country today. This great nation will endure as it has endured, will revive and will prosper. So first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror. Which...